Hello and welcome to Islanders Anxiety from Lighthouse Hockey and the Fans First Sports Network. My name is Dan Saracini. Joining me on this Super Bowl Sunday via Zencaster is my friend Michael Leboff. And Mike, we have a lot to get to. Uh, the Islanders started the week great, ended the week not so great. A lot of drama from uh, up north, uh, both on and off the ice. And uh, then there's an outdoor game coming up a week from today that we need to speak about, I guess. So we got a lot going on. Uh, I will give you the choice. Well, actually, for, let me start here right now. Again, the Islanders lost the Calgary Flames on Saturday after two really, really good games versus the uh, the Leafs and the Lightning last week. Um, where are you at right now in terms of sort of your confidence level in the Islanders after that demoralizing loss on Saturday? Yeah, I, I said right um, during our episode last week that in in all likelihood, you and I will be different people by the time <laughs> we we congregate again a week later. And and I say that I was very wrong because I think <laughs> my confidence level, my optimism, my belief that this team can make a season out of this season is uh, unchanged. <laughs> because w- what we said, we said like you got to go two and one at minimum, get mm-hmm. four points out of uh, out of these three games. The the way that they did it um, definitely deserves some. Uh, both criticism and praise, uh, I think, because just how the game's patterned out, um, there's definitely a lot of uh, stuff we can sink into. But I think the Islanders, because of the way the out-of-town scoreboards have gone, the way that uh, some of these teams set up with their uh, immediate term schedule, Detroit for sure mm-hmm. um, comes to mind. They have a, a really tough stretch of games coming up right now. Um, I think... I just don't think that the Islanders did enough in either direction to make me think, okay, they're, <laughs> they're done or that, okay, now I'm, you know, a hundred percent committed to the idea of this team getting into the playoffs. Uh, so yeah, unchanged, but like you said, they're, the, while the, I'm in, the, in, the, in basically in the same place um, with the Islanders, I, so much stuff happened off the ice that we're going to get into that it, it, it became like a, just a carnival for uh, <laughs> shade of like shade and Freud, you know, a carnival of shade and Freud for, for us, especially. And I'm um, pretty excited to get into that. And, and I think that maybe because of how all that stuff has gone, it's made me a little more confident in the season mm-hmm. that um, th- there are some good feelings seeping into uh, over the border uh, mm-hmm. into my Islander um, kind of, you know, confidence o meter um and it's and it's just it has nothing to do with the team but just because of mm. what we've seen from uh, around the league these past few days and and from the canadian tax authority uh <laughs> so some stuff has has made me think okay maybe there are some things happening around the border that are yeah. are making me think that something is still happening here uh i mean that would be fantastic i do share that you know it seems like a lot is going right for the Islanders while a lot of stuff is going wrong for some other teams, which is, is helpful. Um, that said, uh, what little confidence you have in the Islanders is probably more than what I have, because I really, 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 really hated that game on Saturday, which we're going to get to uh, in, in a short enough time. Uh, before we dive into all this reminder that we are on Patreon, patreon.com slash Islanders anxiety plans start as low as two bucks a month. And you can get ad free episodes of this show, plus bonus podcasts, written posts, and a whole lot more. So sign up today, patreon.com slash Islanders anxiety. Okay. I will give you the choice. Do we want to start with the good or do we want to start with the bad? The bad being obviously front of mind. Yeah. Uh, and then the good stuff happening earlier in the week. Let's, let's start with the Calgary game. Actually. Okay. I think that um, the, the conversation about uh, the other two games will send us into the break um, where, and then when we come out of the break, we have so much to get into with, with one of the teams they played. So. <laughs> Um, I figure let's let's just pitch backwards here. Um, it's still fresh in mind and, and yeah. disappointing. Um, yeah. The Islanders, you know, lose five two. And what what pissed me off here is that the Islanders and Flames are were kind of in the same boat. Yeah. You know, like two teams that are on the fringes of of a playoff race. Yeah. Uh, not all where, bad, but not all good either. Right. Basically. Yeah. yeah. And 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 but trending up uh, yeah. in the right direction. Both teams were riding winning streaks coming into the game. And I think that you could have boiled this game down to one simple question, and it sounds like a cliche, but I think matinees in the NHL, especially at this part of the season, mm-hmm. literally come down to one simple question, and it's who's going to try harder? 
<laughs> and or who's more ready to play this game. Yeah. And the Islanders, despite being in a spot where they have they can't they can't afford ten bad minutes. Yeah. Right? Like you you guys put yourself in a spot where Hey, if, if if the Islanders were where the Bruins were and they wanted to throw in a dud every now and then, mm. you know, by all means, uh, but you you didn't earn that right. So yeah. that's what pissed me off. It was it was almost like they think they're this because because they started to play well under their new coach. It was almost like oh we can just rest on that, rest yeah. on our laurels a bit here and and come out for a, a matinee game and and just expect that the other team will. Oh man, look at the mighty Islanders and Patrick Wild. Like we, we don't have a chance here. Let's just right. get out of here. Um, but it turns out that the Flames just work harder than the Islanders, and that's what happened, and that's why they lost. It, it's funny you mentioned the Bruins, too, because I did, and I'm sure a lot of other people did, too. After the Islanders game was over, it was a 1 o'clock start. Uh, they realized, oh, the Bruins-Caps game is on at 3 o'clock, and obviously the Caps are one of the teams that are you know right around where the Islanders are. And you know, in a way, you're like, oh, this is great. They're, they're playing the Bruins. It should be an easy win for Boston. No, the Bruins ironically did the exact same thing that the Islanders did. It was actually kind of spooky. They just came out and didn't play the game. They had seven shots on goal through two periods and the caps walked away with a three, nothing win. I don't even think the Bruins even, you know, put up much of a fight in the third to even come back. They were only down one, nothing. And then they end up losing three, nothing. And I thought the same exact thing that you did and what you just said, which is like, if the Islanders had a 20 point playoff cushion, then the, well, you know, it's a long season, 82 games. Sometimes you're going to have duds. It's not going to be your night. Wouldn't bother me so much. But when you're the Islanders and you have basically pissed away three-fifths of your season and are on the fringes and need every point you can get, one of those days, quote-unquote, or one of those nights isn't going to flop. And this was a game in which the Islanders had every reason to come out and win. Flames had already beaten the uh the Devils and uh, Bruins on this trip. So, I mean, kudos to them. They, they played really well. We're going to get to the, the game's offensive star in a few minutes. But uh, this was not a game that the Islanders really needed to lose. Like, this was a game, had they put in some more effort, they could have won. I mean, again, the Flames aren't a bad team, but they're not really a good team either. Jacob Markstrom played really, really well. And in his post-game thing, uh, Patrick Waugh was like, you know, the, the big difference, he saw it as a much more even game than maybe we did. But he said that the Flames finished their chances and the Islanders did. And while that's not wrong, uh, it certainly seems like the Islanders were just kind of asleep for most of the time. I mean, they were up, they were down three nothing after two periods. And, you know, Brock Nelson gave them a little bit of life early in the third. But that was really it. Again, Markstrom was really, really good. So give him credit. But this team just, it's a little bit of a microcosm of the season. Like you've just thrown away two thirds of, of the, the time you have to, to play and you just try a little bit harder in the bottom third. And it's just not enough. Like it just, this is not going to work in this scenario. And so they walked out with a, a really demoralizing, like you said, five, two loss, uh, two empty net goals for Calgary, one by Blake Coleman, which made it four, one. Pajo, I know Pajo scores make it four, two, and then Mackenzie Weger scores. So it's, it, it was a big day for empty net goals. We'll, we'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I'll foreshadow a little bit. It was a pretty big day for yep. Saturday's empty net goal. The Islanders still don't have one. It's, it, <laughs> it just blows my mind that, that it's almost automatic uh, against the Islanders at this point. Yeah. And, and it always happens so quickly. It feels like it's just, you know, that they lose, they lose the face off and, the Flames had possession like right away. Yeah. I think for that first one, and I was like, oh, come on. Can you we at least try a little bit? The Islanders did get it back. They, you know, tried something, and they, but, you know, Coleman scored it. Yeah. Yeah. There, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of context to this game uh, off the ice. Like, I, I don't want, I think that it, it simply came down to they, they didn't play well or didn't put out any sort of acceptable effort outside of you know, Barzell and Horvat were good. Mike Riley was good again, I thought. Um, uh, there were a couple bright spots, but the rest of the team really lagged behind. And here's the the, the context was like the, the Islanders are riding this two game win streak. They've, they've kind of put themselves back into a, what you would call coin flip territory to make the playoffs. Um, especially if they uh, had won that game, the, the Penguins had lost on Friday night. The uh, Devils had lost Thursday night when the Islanders won. There was the, the Flyers are, have just yeah. won three in a row now. So there, there's some like, there's a lot of, of balls in the air and the Islanders could have thrown their ball right up in the air too. And uh, 
it was almost as if the team knew like hey like losing this game we've already done our job for the week we've we've got the three the the, the four points out of six that kind of were necessary <laughs> for for us to tick our box and and move on and and whatever and there's a game on Tuesday night uh against the crack and it's their only game until between yeah. now and, and the stadium series so it was almost like the islanders were like eh you know let's just you know we'll, we'll punt on this one and and maybe we'll we'll try to you know re recalibrate for uh Tuesday night and once again like that's all well and good if if you're the Bruins or the Vancouver Canucks or someone who's 15 points clear of the playoff right. line um but when you're the New York Islanders like that you can't do it because now it, it this loss like I said I don't think that this was a must win game by any stretch like I I took a considerable amount of time after the game to remind myself look you would have taken two and one four points uh that is true. out of this week before the game you can't you can't be this mad about this loss but at the same time what it does is it, it makes these next couple of days pretty hellish because that Tuesday night game in a very strange way like it's it's a pretty big inflection point of their s- entire season because it is their only game uh until the stadium series it i want to call it like a true must win game i but i do think it's it's like a game 6 uh I'm, I'm sorry like a game 5 when you're down 3-1 in yeah. in a playoff series uh that's not it doesn't make sense i mean 2-1 when you're down two one in a playoff series, right, uh, and you want to avoid going down three one, uh, it's like that kind of pressure because uh, you're going to just be watching other teams play, like the Penguins, the the Red Wings, the Flyers. Like they all have games all week. The Islanders, the Devils. Like the Islanders are going to be sitting on their hands for almost the entire week, and and then it climaxes with them playing the Rangers at in in the swamps of Jersey. For some reason, two New York teams are going to get ahead to New Jersey to play an outdoor game. And um, so it it just sets up this this cracking game really sets up as a a massive, massive contest where the stakes aren't it's like it's not absolute. It's not a, a zero sum must win in win an in kind of situation, but it it very well should be like I'm looking at it as it just it has the same gravity of something like that, even if ex- mathematically it's not. Basically. Right, exactly. It sh- and or it should is what I should say. It's like right. it should like this game and and you I do trust the coach now to to kind of <laughs> figure that out and and I and I'm thinking of it. Remember we talk about that Capitals game where the Islanders fell flat uh last year and almost completely ruined their season um uh, in what was a basically a, a win and end situation in Washington against a dead on their feet Capitals team and they came out and let up uh with two or three goals within like the first 4 minutes of the game. <laughs> and it was almost as if the team after that game was like, oh, well, we just we didn't realize, you know, what the stakes were. <laughs> Nobody told us, right. you know, that, that we needed to come out and win this game. Um, and you, you trust that these guys are you know professional athletes and they've been in the league. And the coach obviously has been talking about oh, it's playoff hockey for for the Islanders from the moment he got there. Mm-hmm. Um, but for fans, I think it is. And, and the crazy part is it's a Tuesday night game. It's going to be a sleepy kind of crowd right. in February. I think there's some snow in the forecast against yes. the Seattle Kraken, a team the Islanders have nothing to do with in, in terms of like the playoff race or anything. Like, you can't get much further away from the Islanders and the Kraken. Wow. Geographically, they might be the what third furthest team away. And, and this game could very well be what decides how um, the season goes. Because if they, they do get the win, then you're thinking, okay, they've won three of four. They've got points in four of five. They're going into the stadium series here. And we'll mm. see where uh, the chips fall. Because after that, stadium series game the uh the schedule for the islanders it they play the penguins right after that so it's not just a stadium series game but it's right. that game too so you've got a huge game against the kraken which on on its surface like you wouldn't have circled this one at all before the mm-hmm. season but then you have two just massive games one against the rangers and then the penguins but then the schedule kind of gets a little weird again where they're playing the blues twice and like two weeks and they're playing <laughs> the stars and the red wigs it's just uh it, things are get weird and then the schedule opens up like they have this like six or seven game stretch where they could feasibly go you know six oh and one because the, mm. the, the po- opponents are bad mm. um but to get to that uh to get to that point and for it still to be relevant like they they need to find a way through this and now like all these thoughts are going to be going through my head all from now until Tuesday night against the Kraken. Like it's, it, mm. 
this is what's frustrating here is like this this game shouldn't mean life or death Mm. but the islanders have played in such a fashion that it does like it it's it's a fucking excuse me it's a it's just a massive game against an opponent that we should never be playing massive games against in a a part of the schedule that we shouldn't be playing you know must win games but here we are because of the way that they've they've played this whole season yeah and you know somebody somebody mentioned this on in the comments of lighthouse hockey and i apologize for not remembering who it was but like you know we we rode lane lambert hard this whole season because of games like this and you know how could they not have done this they they need a better coach and then they do it under the new coach too and you're like really like maybe not i'm not saying that like you know firing lambert was a mistake or anything because i think it was it was time but like uh it was beyond time really but you know it does make you think maybe the problems are a lot deeper than the coach. Like, you know, here's Patrick Waugh and these guys have spent three weeks now talking about how much they love playing under Patrick Waugh and what a legend he is and how amazing this is. And they come out with a performance like that. It's like, what are you guys doing out here? Like, I just don't, I just don't understand. Like that Washington game was so bad. We did a podcast right after it because we were so mad. And then that was a lot deeper in the season than this one. And again, there's still 30 games left. So there's still some degree of runway here, but it's the same, almost the same exact scenario. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, how do right. you not look at the standings and be like, oh, shit, we need to win this game? Yeah, and, and or just <laughs> play harder. Like, right. I, that's, what, that's what's so perplexing here is this, this team has built up so much equity and, and uh, so much of a reputation for being the team that doesn't take a night off. And the, the past three seasons almost now are just littered with them. Like, they're just littered with games like this where – they figure, ah, we'll just get them. Like you, you always say, like, oh, we'll get them next time. We'll get them next time. And that that effort was so unacceptable, even after uh, the the two wins. Because if they had just come out and played well, you'd be like, you know what, two wins, hard fought loss to a team that's yeah. that's going well right now, great. But now it's just it it kind of kicks you it kicks you in the gut a bit here, and and put you in a it, it put all of us in a in a bad place. Like nobody that I was talking to wanted to be talking about the islanders at you know 3 30 p.m till <laughs> till about 9 30 p.m um uh, when a situation happened in uh in Can- canada canada um nobody really wanted to talk hockey and and i don't blame anybody for it because it was just one of those putrid efforts and they do it on you know, these guys all have kids too which is funny so you think mm. that like on a day the the only matinee of the season to, to date at at home it's next gen day there's a million kids in the building you think yeah, you know, these these guys get it. They they understand like what what's what's going on here. They they'll they'll want to come out and put forth a decent effort, be the right. role models we all think they are. And <laughs> yeah, they fall flat on their face. And uh, I know we should move on to the to the more positive stuff. But I also want to bring up one thing, which is like to me the the biggest culprit of of this game was Oliver Wallstrom again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the man who was getting all the rope earlier this week yeah. suddenly got all twisted up and tied up in it, and 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 stifled himself once again. It's you know, yeah. it's driving me up a wall because yeah. it seems like, and I think why I guess deserves some credit for not sitting him after the penalty against the Leafs. The Islanders mm-hmm. win. Wallstrom, yeah, I guess has an okay game against the Lightning, but everybody did. He tried yeah. to steal a goal or convince everyone he <laughs> scored that first goal, and um, but. What what's driving me up a wall with him is um that I feel like a lot of times in players in his situation, whether it's uh Julian Gauthier or just mm. you know, every team has these guys. The the criticism is he's just gripping his he's putting too much pressure on himself. He's yeah. gripping his stick too tight. Um and he's just not converting on his chances. He's getting them, but he's not. But this guy's just kind of it feels like he's just going through yeah. the motions a bit and and maybe that's unfair for me to say, but it it feels like he's there's there's he's he's not impactful at all like he's not doing stuff off the puck he's at all that that's like okay like at least he's you know he's throwing the body around he's a pretty big guy he's he's powerful going forward he's he's just not doing that stuff because every game like clockwork you'll get a, a tweet from one of the islanders beat writers being like oh mm-hmm. good shift from wallstrom like who yeah. cares that's one yeah. shift like it doesn't matter until yeah. he does that all game long and then he does yeah. it again for the next game like this isn't we're not asking him to have like one flash of, of right. brilliance we know he has that like that's been his entire career has been 10 games off then he does something special and mm. you're like damn that was sick like hopefully he can keep doing that and then he doesn't 
And then he does it again 10 games later. And then he does it again 10, 10 games yeah. later. So seeing like Andrew Gross or or whoever mm-hmm. tweet out like, oh, Wallstrom's got jumped today. And then two minutes later, he's <laughs> being benched because he's just not right. impactful at all is getting on my nerves a bit here yeah. too. Because that to me is the Islanders' biggest weak point of the roster right now is that uh, they they can't roll four lines consistently because the their third line, one of their third line wingers is just a dud. And yeah. I think that kind of has uh, ripple effects everywhere else in the lineup because all of a sudden you're benching people you're yeah. you're you're playing barzell and horvat you know 25 minutes a night so mm-hmm. yeah he's it's either got to be him or, or the islanders got to do something with that spot because it's if 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 they want to to make a run here because it's yeah. clearly not not working and he he's now gotten his umpteenth chance and <laughs> yeah yeah the, the chances are are too too many to number and i've started calling him oliver one shift that's that's my name for him yes yeah, that's, that's, that's what he kind of is like it just yep. comes out and like like you said that game against the lightning we'll get to in a second you know he goes to the net hard looks like he he knocked in a goal and it turns out it's dobson's but it's like hey you know good good work on that play wally and then he was not seen or heard from again and the Islanders won six to two in that game you know like so it, it's it's a problem um one last thing actually I, I should also point out um when you mentioned four lines you know nobody was really working that well yesterday you know barzell was i guess okay horvat had a, a couple of chances he seemed to be trying to make something go in the you know late in the game but it didn't really work lee was all but invisible um nelson did not look right to me i know he scored the goal he took that big hit in the lightning game uh he just didn't look right to me and i hope he's not dealing with anything right now obviously they have a few days off so if he is he can get some rest but just didn't look look all that right to me that line and you know i'm i'm really it, it's funny because uh larry brooks has a column today about the devil's problems and how they were unforeseen although apparently having bad goaltending and having your three best players hurt for most of the season is is a, a mystery to old brooksy but he does bring up a good point that timo meyer is making 8.8 million and he has two more points than than Engvall does like he's got 18 points and Engvall has 16 and the Islanders are paying Engvall 3 million. So I guess in that case, it's not too bad, but I'm very much off the Engvall train at this point. I just, I don't know what it is that he's trying to do out there. And it's not like he's facilitating the other guys, you know, doing a ton of stuff either. So, yeah. Well, I think this is all kind of related, right? Like they have, we have one guy who's clearly struggling, like not like he's, there was a, a play yesterday where, uh, Oliver Wallstrom dumped the puck into the corner mm. from from the blue line, but the problem was that it was he dumped it from the Islanders blue line into the Islanders corner, <laughs> and, and got the Flames set up on a four check, um, right. right in the first period. So that that to me was a perfect kind of moment in time for where he's he's been. And so when you when you have one guy who's who's not who's clearly like he's almost like a, an automatic to not contribute. Yeah. Nobody else can have off. Nobody else can have off nights because you know you're not going to really get anything from right. your twelfth forward, who's Matt Martin, who I think is also, you know, he's struggling, yeah. struggling a bit too. Yeah, I think sure. the Islanders might be playing Tough. a little bit too fast for him. Almost every um, time the Islanders get get like stuck in their own zone, it's almost I would say two out of every three times that happens, Martin is on the ice. Yeah, and I hate yeah. saying that because I love Matt Martin, but yeah, and and also like he's he's a guy who just shouldn't be playing every game in the NHL. Like, yeah, just, that's yeah. what it is, and and the, well, but the Islanders don't have. Well, fashing is hurt right now. That's the yeah, problem. exactly. So they don't have like the replacement for him. But so, would he be playing if he were healthy? That's another question. Yes, who knows? <laughs> right. But, exactly. but so, like, the point is, like, if 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 Wallstrom was was going well, or the Islanders had a player right. in that spot going well, like, you don't have yeah. to worry about it because you, yeah. you could say, okay, there's our one forward who's who's maybe not going to contribute much, but he's still serves a purpose, whatever. But when so when Wallstrom isn't going, and then you have guys like Angval who's who's been inconsistent of late. I thought he was really good in the Leafs game, and I thought he was pretty good in the the Lightning game. Yeah, um, Nelson, like you said, it's been a little yeah. off his game, but this is kind of what he does, and he'll get hot eventually, and we'll we'll all be yeah. you know, putting his number back in the Raptors. I think Paul Mary's been good, <laughs> but like so, if if you have four guys now, because uh, I think you could throw Lee in that boat too. Like you got four or five guys who aren't going, like it becomes a problem, and it's where the situation is. Okay, Lee's not working out right now. He's he's struggling a bit. Maybe we need to switch things up. Oh, you know who who the perfect fit for that first line should be? It should be Oliver Walsham. The problem is 
he's been terrible. So we, we can't do that. So he, his, his not working out is, is causing other issues to become bigger than they should be in my mind. So, um, it doesn't seem maybe I'm nitpicking and, and a little little harsh here because it's just been frustrating and I think you and I are just kind of sick of the uh, <laughs> give this guy a chance um, yeah, out I there know. when when um when he clearly has that uh but it's maybe I'm I'm being harsh but it's I think that is a bit of a bigger problem than it's being made out to be yeah. uh, right now. That's all true. I agree one million percent. One last thing about this terrible game before we move on to two much much better games. Um. This uh, is the second time that I have seen a defenseman score a hat trick against the Islanders. Uh, Some of you may remember back in Barclays Center, uh, one of the few times I was very, very, very angry at the Trots Islanders. Again, we we love Barry here, but, you know, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows all the time, was when uh, Jacob Slavin of the Carolina Hurricanes scored a hat trick at Barclays Center against the Islanders in what I also think was basically kind of a must win game or a big game for them at that time. And uh, I was so pissed off. I, I don't even know if I could think for the rest of the day. Well, history has repeated itself because Mackenzie Weger of the Calgary flames came in and scored a hat trick against the Islanders on Saturday. Now Slavin's a good player. Weger is a good player, but am I wrong in thinking that this is like the ultimate insult is having a defenseman score a hat trick against your team. Unless that defenseman's name is pot van, Coffee, Bork, Pronger, Niedermeyer, even Kale McCarr. Like if Kale McCarr scores a hat trick against your team, hey, you know what? Dude's one of the best players in the league. If Quinn, if Quinn Hughes, by the way, if he ever gets a hat trick, it's definitely going to be against the Islanders because he always scores against the Islanders. Mackenzie Weger, guys like Jacob Slavin, they do not get that luxury. And so I was so mad. This was, I think, beside the missed opportunity that we've been talking about for almost a half hour now, the fact that a defenseman, Left this game with an empty with a uh, hat trick, including an empty net goal, made me so mad. <laughs> I could I could have killed somebody. Like I could have broken something in half. Am I crazy or is this like again one of the ultimate insults? Like come on, it's no, not as insulting as taking a slap shot into an empty net. I suppose, <laughs> but you know, it's got to be close, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And and it's just this stuff seems to find us and right at the, at the worst possible time. Kind of like uh, you know, you were talking about Sheldon Rempel scoring for the yeah. Vegas Golden Knights the other night, and it was it was just like the worst possible time for that to pop up. The Islanders right. were just about to kill off a penalty. This guy comes on and and you know he scores a soft goal, and the Islanders end up playing really well in that game, and that goal is basically the difference. So, hmm. um, yeah, I I this stuff finds us, and uh, I know that other fan bases feel the same way, but hmm. I think the Islanders have a have a pretty pretty long list of of stuff like this that. If we were going, if you're going like tit for tat with a, a Senators fan or, or <laughs> someone like that, like you can just be like, well, this happened. Oh yeah, that's weird. This happened. That's weird. So, um, yeah, that was, it was, it was just a frustrating afternoon all around. And yeah. the problem was that that's the taste that's in our mouth coming into this podcast because it, yeah. it should be a more positive show, I think, mm. um, because the Islanders end up winning two games against teams that they're chasing. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go back to that. The, the first of those, we'll just go back in chronological order and we'll talk about the 6-2 win against the Lightning. Um, maybe their best game of the season, certainly in the conversation. Uh, it's good to have Casey Sezikis back and he played really well in that game, ended up scoring the uh, the sixth and final goal, uh, kind of stealing the puck, shaking free and scoring. It was a vintage Sezikis playoff goal, if I may say so. Um, but uh, it was a really good game overall. Finally, 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 the Islanders looked like a team that was rested playing a team that was on a back-to-back. The Lightning had played the Rangers the night before. The Islanders had more jump than them, more energy than them the entire time. Shots after the first period were 14-3 to three Islanders. Uh, the Lightning only had 10 shots through two periods. Um, everybody looked great. Ryan Pollock scores a goal. Like, um, somebody wins a faceoff, goes right to Pollock, and he just slaps in a power play goal. And it's like, why don't we just do this all the time? Why isn't this happening 20 times a season? I don't understand. Why Why just now, you know, when everything is going well, but I guess that's just the way it is. Sometimes everything is going well for you. Uh, you know, the great goal, Dobson, then Kucherov tied it. And you're like, oh, great, here they come. Barzell with an absolutely sick backhand. One of the best goals we've ever seen him score. Palmieri, like you said, had a good game. He got in on it. Bo Horvat had a great goal from Barzell, who was behind the net. Basically, everything just working for them. Sorokin barely had any work. Only had made 18 saves. 
Jonas Johansson also had 18, but on way more shots because the Islanders had it was 20 shots were 24 20 Islanders at the end of the day, but really the Lightning, you know, were had all the score effects in the third period because by that point the game was was effectively over. Uh, it was a statement win, and it was really good, and it was so good. And the Islanders played so well that even the ESPN commentary team of John Butchagross, PK Subban, and Mark Messier couldn't ruin the game. Uh, <laughs> why they chose to have those guys at the game and Ferraro, uh, uh, what the hell is his name? Uh, Sean McDonough and Emily Kaplan in the studio. I have no idea, but I didn't hate these guys um, during this broadcast. I will say that they, they spent an inordinate amount of time kissing the ass of Nikita Kucherov which I thought was also kind of weird. The, no other Lightning player got it, any mentions at all, it felt like, just Kucherov. And again, he's he's earned it. He's a great player. But uh, they had a lot of nice things to say about the Islanders. Too bad was like, wow, this is a whole different team under Patrick Waugh. It's really hard to disagree. Uh, you were at this game. So I'm interested to hear yeah. your take from inside UBS Arena. Yeah, I, well, I was I was grateful to be there because I found out the, the uh, who the broadcaster was. And, um, <laughs> you know, I still, you know, I watched the, the highlights coming home and there's yeah. definitely a lot to. Yeah. It's a lot true. of weird stuff, um, mostly from Bucci Gross. I didn't hear the other people much on the highlights, but um, Barzell's goal where he uh, backhanded one past uh, Jonas Johansson was, mm. uh, it sounded like Bucci Gross might have, someone should have called an ambulance or something. <laughs> uh, but we, we've talked about it enough, and we have, have we have bigger fish to fry in the second half than to get really into the ESPN broadcast. I've, I heard a lot of people were pissed off about it. Um, so thank God they won, because otherwise it would have been a, a, they'd be even more mad. Um, and and it goes into the point of that we were talking about last week with the All Star Game, which is w- what the NHL is trying to sell and what fans want to be sold is just they're two completely different things. Yeah. Like the it's just the NHL just wants every game, every broadcast, every All Star Skills competition to lead to a you know twenty second viral clip on Twitter. Yeah. Um, where Justin Bieber is wearing a jacket or something when, and fans just, they want their team to win and for professionals to call mm-hmm. their game. Um, so these are, these are two very different conflicting forces. We'll see if, if we can, uh, find a way to, to meet in some happy middle where maybe, uh, guys like Alan Furing and Brandon Burke and those, those folks, those types are, are calling games and the, the guys doing cartwheels in, in the booth can just be the color or do the studio stuff um but onto the game yeah i mean it it was a funny crowd at ubs Mm -hmm. arena because people were pretty jacked up about the way things are going they they get to win on monday so they they have a massive game against the lightning the lightning they played the the rangers the night before sergachev gets hurt johansson's in goal it just felt like yeah things were um things were trending towards an Islander win, which is when we're at our scariest, of course. <laughs> um, and the Islanders, they come out, they start playing well. Wallstrom pretends to score. Um, the Lightning get one back. But it, it was a, it was really evident. After the Lightning scored that goal to tie at 1-1, like the mm. Islanders, it, it looked like the those Trots teams when they were, when they were the 18-wheeler that he right. would talk about because it just didn't phase them at all. And they just kept going and and really you know that that was the first comfortable win uh at home that in in quite a long time and mm. uh it, it felt nice to 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 be able to, to have the discussion of should we get out of here early uh i know that like yeah. people were, were mad that people didn't stick around to the end of the game but look you don't get we don't get too many chances to think uh to, to even have that discussion because we're we're we've been too busy watching the Islanders up three, one with like seven minutes left at home and, and <laughs> knowing, okay, we got 20 more minutes here because this going to going overtime at the very least. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, a great game around. I think Barzell is just, you know, he's flying, uh, of course, all credit to, to the NHL all-star skills competition for, <laughs> for Matt Barzell becoming good. Him. That, right. that is the, the prevailing, the prevailing, uh, thought around hockey, the hockey universe is that, Matt Barzell is playing well uh, because he was he was in the All Star Game Skills Competition and it's it's unlocked him. Patrick Waz found out that Matt Barzell is good too uh, and, and is giving him more minutes, which certainly doesn't help, but uh, right. it doesn't hurt. But um, yeah, I mean, there's very little to complain about this game because it just it was as clinical and kind of punishing as the Islanders have been all season. 
mm. and you you left that arena. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about something we talk about a lot, which is that Islander fans are we're just kind of in constant fear of the other shoe dropping. Yes, and always. so when when after this game, like Patrick Waugh gives these great quotes, and then at the next the next day they have a practice, and he he gives a great quote about how Islander fans are heart people, and just completely. <laughs> Um, Mike Robbins, I believe, is the one who DM'd me this saying that uh, that was his through the island moment, and I and I think yeah. that's actually a Makes pretty sense. Yeah. pretty good an- analogy. And um, but I bring up the the other shoe dropping is because like it's it's taking a lot to get used to knowing that like Patrick Wise is, is our coach, like he is our nobody can just come and swoop in and take him. Like yeah. th- they can try, and and people could talk about that possibility. Oh, wouldn't it be so funny if? The Molson family just hires a, a stretch limo and sends it down to Long Island, yes. and and he the the owner of the Montreal Canadiens with you know Kirk Muller and and all the other greats are just standing on Patrick Waugh's front lawn with the the boombox that John Cusack <laughs> held over his head, uh, right. but it's singing in French instead of uh, he's it's singing the Peter Gabriel song in French instead right. of English, and they just put him in the the limo and they drive him back up to Montreal or to to Colorado or wherever, um it's taking a a considerable amount of effort uh, internally for me to just not think about the other shoe with this coach and just enjoy that. Oh man. Like there's possibility that he's here for years and years and years and years, because that's how it works sometimes. Like sometimes coaches just work and stay there forever. And wouldn't that be nice? And, and I'm, I know you're getting ahead of myself a bit, but the point is I, like, I, I'm trying so hard not to think of, man, I got to I got to enjoy this guy while I can, because he can be gone at any second. You know, because of what we went through with uh, the the guy we drafted in front of Victor Hedman in in two thousand nine, like yeah. this is uh it's it's taking like some some actual mental like strength to not think like that because uh, he he has these great press conferences and you're like oh, man, it's like I already miss him, which is right. it's such a strange feeling. I'm like oh man, I remember when Patrick Wild was our head coach, like he just started. Yeah. I need to, and I feel like this is a very specific islander fan condition to like mm-hmm. think to think this way and and maybe it's because of the trauma that we went through fan trauma that we went to i should say that yeah uh i think like this but I'm, I'm trying my best not to and just enjoy it for that it's there there is no end like there is no end in sight right now yeah i mean no i'm the same way and i find myself you know especially when again you're losing matinee games which is something that's happened now under the last what five head coaches that they've had, you know, like it's, it's hard to shake that kind of stuff. And I think, Wa, you know, he's coming in with a kind of a fresh look at things and he's not, you know, he doesn't really care that he doesn't know what the Islanders record in matinee games is. He's in, he, I mean, I don't even know if he knows how we feel about the whole Tavares thing. Like, you know, he's not going to hear, he wasn't here for these games. I don't know. Was he watching them on TV? I mean, I guess maybe he was watching the one. I think he said he watched a game against the Leafs, but like, um, you know, I, I think he, he deserves the benefit of the doubt and that kind of clean slate, but sometimes this stuff is hard to shake, especially when this roster has been largely the same for the last 10 years. Like it's hard to, you know, again, where is, you know, not to get back to the, the flames game, but like, you know, how does Anders Lee look at these teammates and be like, yeah, I guess we're doing okay. Like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you know, the score here, you're not a stupid idiot. You know, you're a smart guy. Like, you know, like you got to get in there and do this, get this game back under control. Like, I don't understand. So there's going to be a lot of that. And I mean, we got, we got away from a lot of that under trots. Like he got us thinking of new ways, you know, and then we, we had a whole other set of trauma that we had to worry about, you know, like, you know, again, they, they would go through these periods where they wouldn't win a game for a month. And then, Oh my God, they're going to be missing. They're going to miss the playoffs. And then, Nope, everything has stopped now. And now we're a juggernaut again. So it was kind of a weird, there's all these weird situations, but you know, why it's only been three weeks. Like, I know it seems kind of weird, but that was only the sixth game under him. So we have a long way to go. And, I hope that, you know, I like to think too, and again, you, you want to talk about getting ahead of yourself. I, my thing is he keeps talking about having this opportunity again. And this is a guy who, again, had a job and then quit and thought his phone was going to ring. And then it did for seven years until Lou Lamorello called. So, you know, I think he understands that. I think he's here for a long time, but uh, this team needs a lot of help. And I don't know if Patrick yep. Waugh is enough of it to get, you know, getting some of these guys going. But Everything was working uh, on uh, Thursday against the Lightning. And uh, again, it made an e- even an ESPN broadcast light watchable. It was very enjoyable. It's nice to like go into a uh, a third period up six to two and be like, yeah, okay, well, this is great. Um, but of course, you're not going to get an empty net goal that way. Uh, 
Uh, however, uh, or I should say that game came on the heels of another pretty darn good game Tuesday, uh, excuse me, Monday night in Toronto soon, right after the all-star game, another win three, two, um, over the, the hated leaps and the guy who, again, the Islanders drafted first overall a few years back. Um, it was a pretty even game. Uh, they were up one, nothing Barzell had a great goal, Mitch Marner. So the first minute of the second period was very eventful. Bo Horvath gets into a fight with new Leafs, uh, Boyer Salming, Simone Benoit. Uh, somehow the Leafs end up with an extra power play out of it, uh, or at least it's four on four. Mitch Marner scores immediately. But then Kyle McClain, who has subsequently been sent back to Bridgeport because guys like Casey Zekas are back off IR, uh, gets out of the penalty box and scores his first NHL goal. Talk about things that never happened for the Islanders. This was a dream come true. Uh, obviously, John McClain is his dad, is an assistant coach. Sportsnet wants to memorialize the moment. And who do they fixate their camera on? Doug Huda, the other bald guy on the Islanders <laughs> bench. So great job, Sportsnet. Uh, that was a really funny. MSG got it right. I don't know. These Thought you were going to say like you know, Brad Tree Living or, no, or no, no, Dubis no. in, in Pittsburgh or something. Like He's the bald one. Oh, there's yeah. two of them. You picked the, pick one. You picked the wrong one. Anyway. Um, it looked like it was going to be great. Uh, they were kind of hanging on though in the third. Tavares, of course, ties it. This son of a bitch always scores against the Islanders. Uh, but then with two minutes to go, the former Leaf, Pierre Engvall, banks in a rebound or knocks in a rebound off of, I think it was a Palmieri or a Nelson shot. Islanders hang on. Leafs are all over them. Ilya Sorokin was enormous. The week off did him very, very well. And uh, right afterwards, Cal Clutterbuck. Pushed Tavares, Scott Mayfield pushed, you know, Tavares pushed back. Mayfield knocked him down. A whole scrum breaks out. These guys were definitely like groomsmen at this guy's wedding, and now they're kind of fighting and stuff. Uh, it was hilarious, and my only regret is that this game did not happen at UBS Arena because when that pushing and shoving happened, the roof would have literally collapsed, not only on UBS, but on the, the rinks outside that they just built would have literally Rum crumbled into dust uh, with people yelling and shouting at the end of that game. So really good game. You know, not a perfect, perfectly executed game from the Islanders standpoint, but uh, it was hard to argue with the the outcome. Uh, a lot of guys had really good games. Engvall had a really good game the entire time, I thought. He kind of deserved a goal. Got one just at the right time. And the best part was we got about a week's worth of Leafs angst out of podcasts and radio shows and stuff like that. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, what'd you make of this one? It feels like it happened 10 years ago, but it was really only a week ago. <laughs> yeah. So this, this one I think actually was, was maybe their most encouraging game, win of the season. It, not their best played win, but yeah. maybe their most encouraging win because the Leafs played damn well in this game. Like this, yeah. if you listen to people talk, it was like the next day on, on the Jeff Marrick show or, wherever it was oh the Leafs the Leafs deserve to win that game the Sorokin stole it and Sorokin was really really good but I thought the Islanders deserved a lot more credit than that I think you could have said it was it, it was going to come down to which team made uh the big mistake and that big mistake happened to be uh Morgan Riley uh in a in a yeah. in a week's worth of mistakes for him um and that Engvall goal like the, the puck slid in so slowly under Samsonov that time yeah. kind of paused for a little bit and, and things were moving slow and it was hard not to think as that puck you're watching that puck just slowly slide slide through the Leafs goalie after Morgan mm -hmm. Riley turned the puck over um that something's happening like here with this team like there there's there is some sort of real positive momentum because this kind of stuff doesn't happen mm -hmm. uh to this team this these kind of revenge this revenge game for Pierre Angval after the the video tribute and then they show him on the bench and he's looking at Patrick Wad drawing on the marker board. Then sorry, let me correct you right here. It was not a video tribute. Right. It was a still picture. Tribute. A still picture. Of, yes. Difference. Yes. <laughs> and then they showed him on the bench and he, uh, right. Yep. He's not paying attention at all. Sure and, <laughs> and, and Carlo Kuliakovo and a bunch of other Leafs people are like, if we're doing tribute videos for Pierre Engvall, like hmm. where, where does it stop? And, and I just want to, once again, this is this is what we that drives us up a wall with this team and, and the way it's covered is this is what every team does. So it's like it right. was almost as if they, they, they just truly don't pay attention to anything no. except for you know how it affects the Leafs and uh if you didn't think he was gonna get a tribute video, like have you been watching how this and this is it's been a bit in the NHL for like three seasons now that right. 
basically everybody gets one. Uh, you know, Austin Zarnick might get one for the for the Islanders if <laughs> if he hasn't played against us yet at UBS Arena. So right. just just get ready for that kind of stuff. It's such a such a rote thing. Like how are, how are we getting mad about this? Like, yeah, I don't understand. I didn't understand. Yeah, I, I I thought they were gonna they were more mad about that than him scoring. <laughs> uh, but so like that revenge stuff very rarely happens to the Islanders. Like you said, the Kyle McLean first NHL goal coming that way. That mm. stuff very rarely happens to benefit the Islanders. Um, and then the next morning, uh, who's who's the, ver- the the Canadian version of Uncle Sam? Is it Uncle Gord? Uncle Gord <laughs> comes comes knocking on John Tavares' door. I mean, it, it was really really hard not to get caught up into thinking yeah. things are things are kind of pointing to maybe something happening here on the yeah. island. Uh, and as the week had had gone, I think the next night was kind of tough. Because uh, basically every team we wanted to lose ended up winning, mm. um, yeah. so that slowed the momentum down a bit. But but still, like the ta- Canadian Revenue Authority or whatever they're called, mm. throwing us that bit of red meat was just yeah. so unforeseen and and beautiful, especially <laughs> coming right after the Islanders beat the Leafs. Right. Uh, Tavares scores the goal to tie it and like is amped up, and you can see it. And then the Islanders just attack him afterwards. Yeah. I've been waiting so long right for the islanders to do that to like take some take some liberties with Tavares, and it was almost as if clutterbuck and mayfield and clutterbuck was the one who started it with the cross check and um then Tavares went after him and mayfield took care of Tavares. but it was almost as if clutterbuck kind of sensed the moment like this could be it this could be my last chance to take a piece out of this guy because mm-hmm. who knows if he's on this team after this and if we'll play him again who knows if i'm on the islanders Right. Next week, uh, next year, uh, with my contract being up, uh, it's been you know six, seven years. I'm I've been waiting to do this, and because it, it, that's not the kind of thing like the Islanders really do. Like it, yeah, they they do start some stuff after whistles, like everybody else. But usually, it's it's guy skating into Sorokin or mm. do taking a couple extra wax on somebody, whatever. They they do stand up for each other, unlike you know the the team they were playing. But um, that one was so unprovoked, yeah, that it it was a little. People think that would be in character for Cal Clutterbuck. I would say I would disagree with that. Like he's happy to oblige and 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 get into the mud when uh, the situation calls for it. But he sought that out, and I truly appreciate it. Like that was that was for us. That was for the fans. <laughs> that was for us to, that he did that. He gave us. Some, I mean, that I've watched that video a million times now, and mm. um, it, it, which is crazy because I've then now watched another lease video. Uh, you know, maybe more than that, and it <laughs> these things happening in such tight a tight time frame, right? Islanders beat Leafs with Angval scoring game winning goal. Tavares gets jumped. Tavares uh, Uncle Gord comes comes knocking for Tavares's money. Saturday night we'll get into later. That happens like all within seven days, and mm. yeah, it's, it's like I've been thinking about the hockey gods a lot lately, and I don't know what they have in store for us in terms of this season, but. It feels like the, the this move to bring Wa uh, to Long Island has just appeased them. Like mm. it just it's it's making so much sense. He gets us, we get him. The Islander fans just they we want to be embraced and understood. He right. seems to be the same, feeling the same way. Um, you know, he said after that Lightning game, um, because people were chanting his name. Like uh, he wants us to know, like oh, I love them just as much. Like this is yeah. this is a a really beautiful relationship the beginning stages of when it seems and um all this stuff that's happening on the periphery is making me believe it more like i know that patrick wad didn't call the canadian revenue authority and say hey i don't think <laughs> to I mean, Lou, Lou Lamarello might have I right. mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah here's a funny thing about john Tavares, who lives in scarborough <laughs> ontario uh <laughs> you may want but to I, uh, investigate his signing <laughs> bonus. You didn't hear it from me. And they hang click. Uh, but yeah, it, it, like I, th- I feel like these things are happening since the the coaching change. Like, there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on mm. around the team and and our rivals, and it's it's making me think that there's something. Mm. Maybe it was the mask I bought and and the the thought and the request I made of of the gods, the Mayan gods, when I was in Mexico to. To like please <laughs> help because very yeah. soon after that, I mean Patrick Wah was here, but yeah, it makes sense to me. I don't it know. It does. It does feel very cosmic, like something cosmically is happening. 
Yeah. And in true Islanders fashion, it's not a guarantee that it's uh, going to help us win on the ice. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's to, uh, to satiate our, um, our shade and Freud tanks yeah. rather than, you know, the win loss column. It's, it's like that stuff is almost secondary to, Hey, yeah. like this isn't, you, you, maybe you waited too long to, to appease us or to ask for forgiveness from the hockey gods for mm. whatever. Um, but we, we will show you that we do appreciate this beautiful union between the Patrick Waugh and the Islanders by, uh, mm. by just picking on <laughs> the, the John Tavares's bank account and, and all yeah. sorts of other stuff that we, we appreciate we, you're seen and you're heard. And even if it doesn't come with wins, it's, it's still appreciated. Mm. Let me throw another quick thing on top of that pile of evidence before we hit the break. Uh, another one of those things might be the Penguins losing 2-1 to Marc-Andre Fleury and the Minnesota Wild on Marc-Andre Fleury night. I thought that was yep. very appropriate as well. <laughs> and almost like, ah, that's an interesting, you know, results for the Islanders to be sure. But yeah, it's possible. Uh, you know, all, all that maybe is, you know, it's something to at least lift our spirits, even for, you know, yep. when, when they have been... Uh, diminished by, and, uh, and congratulations to to mark andre fleury uh it's not said enough it's not <laughs> it's not shown enough the guy the guy only gets what one one ser- post-game pre-game ceremony yeah a week he only gets one you know yeah. eighteen thousand word feature article written about how he's just the nicest guy a week mm. uh that's just not enough so uh mm-hmm. yep yeah, here's you know maybe we should dedicate this this should that this this podcast to mark andre fleury because not enough has been dedicated <laughs> uh to this guy yeah well, we might find some other people to dedicate this <laughs> at some point because uh, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about the Islanders' next couple of games, the uh, the cracking game, and then obviously the outdoor stadium series game, and then we are going to talk about uh, Johnny Tax Evasion and his team up north. Real quick, though, we do have an answer for you. The Canadian equivalent to Uncle Sam is not Uncle Gord, although it should be. It is Johnny Canuck. The uh, sort of lumberjack guy with the head. Right, they, right, the Canucks right. use him as their sort of, uh, you know, alternate logo. So there you go. So Johnny Canuck, Uncle Sam, they're uh, kind of uh, two peas in a pod there. So there you go. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if Johnny. Go Canuck, get him. Go get him, Johnny Canuck. Go yeah, get him. Exactly. I don't know if Johnny Canuck was ever part of the uh, Justice League of Canada the way Uncle Sam was uh, part of the Justice League of America. But uh, that's another story for another time. OK, come back on the other side. And we got a lot of other stuff to get to. OK, meet us over there. Thanks. And now, a word from our sponsors. First is VintageIceHockey.com, where you can get t-shirts, hoodies, jerseys, mugs, and more, featuring over 100 classic hockey logos. Vintage Ice Hockey also carries our Al Arbor and the Island merch, and our portion of the sales always go directly to the Center for Dementia Research. Use the code ANXIETY20 to save 20% off an order of two items. That is VintageIceHockey.com. Try wines from the Pinot Project. They offer a rosé, a Pinot Grigio, and a Pinot Noir that was named a 2022 Top 100 Best Buy by Wine Enthusiast Magazine. All are delicious, priced at less than $15 a bottle, and available at local wine shops and at UBS Arena. Learn more at thepinotproject.com. Please drink responsibly. So as we stated before, the Islanders only have Two games this week, one on Tuesday against the Seattle Kraken at UBS Arena. And then Sunday, they are playing in MetLife Stadium in New Jersey in the outdoor stadium series game against the Rangers. Let's talk about the Seattle game real quick. No offense to the Kraken, but this is not the marquee matchup this week. We talked about it a little bit before, so we don't really need to get too deep into it. Kraken, very much like the Flames, a team that's not all bad, a team that's not all good, a team that, frankly, the Islanders should beat. And after their performance on Saturday, you would hope that they would have had a collective sort of come to Jesus moment and be like, yeah, we need to, we need to beat this team. So, you know, anything less than two points out of this game is frankly unacceptable. Like, I I don't want to see another shark situation where, you know, ah, they got this in the bag and then they lose in overtime. You need two points out of this because God only knows what's going to happen on Sunday. Uh, First of all, A, are you going to this game on Tuesday? And B, what are your thoughts? I know you mentioned it before, but. Yeah, yeah, I'll probably be there. And. Um, like I said, I just I feel like there's so much more weight to this game than there there needed to be, um, because of how they played in Calgary. Like had had they won that game, and and I hate looking back on, uh, games, keeping you up at night and be like, oh, if we just had gotten 
two points against instead of one against the Devils, the Red Wings, the Hurricanes, the Sharks. Go down the list. Like that stuff just you know will eat away at you over a course of a season. Um, so I'm trying not to think of it that way. But had the Islanders won that game against Calgary, like this would be a little bit less, um, you know, sure fraught. And right. and now it feels, you know, like I said, like a, almost like this weird one game playoff. Um, between two teams that aren't they're not even in a playoff against one another but they're both playing a playoff game uh on the same sheet of ice it's 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 very weird um so pretty weird stakes for this one hopefully uh lou lamarillo makes a trade for jordan everly before the game and we can <laughs> slot him in but uh yeah I'm, I'm i'm pretty terrified of this one um especially because then they have you know, so much time off after it mm. and, and that time off leads to us to the stadium series against the rangers yeah um well, all right. So let, let's talk about Everly real quick. Um, I know, listen, I love Jordan Everly. Everybody loves Jordan Everly. He came in with the Islanders. Talk about guys who get it. Like he got it right away. Certainly had no no connection to the Islanders before that showed up. And the best thing about Everly was that you know, he got run out of Edmonton for not being good in that one playoff series. And then he showed up and became just an absolute playoff machine for the Islanders. And it was great. And I loved having him. But, and I, you know, I wouldn't mind depending on the, you know, the cost, taking a, a, another flyer on him. I'm sure he'd love to come back. He's still tight with Barzell. So I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not against reacquiring Everly, but I do think there's a bit of revisionist history going on in that, you know, Everly, like guys like Palmieri, like Engvall, although not quite to the same degree, um, like a lot of the other players that are on this team, would go quiet for nine 12, 15, 20 games at a clip, and you would be like, what is going on with this guy? I mean, there were seasons when he was just snake bit, just like, what is going on with this guy? And he would get chance after chance after chance and just not score. And then, you know, at the end of the year, you'd be like, yeah, he had 21 goals or whatever. And you're like, that's fine. But uh, it always felt like it could have been much more. So, like, to me, Everly and Palmieri are kind of two sides of the same coin. Like, one guy is grows a better beard, one guy's an American from the island, another guy's from way out in Saskatchewan, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if Paul Mary plays guitar. I know he probably isn't as good as Everly. So, like, you know, again, I'm not against Everly coming here, especially if it's just a, you know, cheap, you know, it doesn't cost that much. I wouldn't give up a first rounder or anything for him. But uh, I do think that people are kind of not remembering the times when this guy couldn't, didn't look like he could shoot the puck into the ocean. So, uh, I mean, what do you think? Like, do you think Everly makes sense? We should do, we're going to do like a whole trade deadline thing at some point, but they are playing Seattle, so I guess it's worth talking about. But like, do you see Everly as maybe a worthwhile get uh, at the deadline? Uh, I, I think it's just he, he'd be a flat out upgrade over, um, mm. well, over Walston for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, and and he, I think he would be the kind of player that would then bump down everybody into their right spot because mm. he could play either with Barzell and Horvat, or he could play with yeah. Nelson and Palmieri, and then then the Islanders have a little more flexibility there. But um, I do think that it might just be a. Uh, one of those situations where it's like he, he's he, he it would be I'd be more excited about just the idea of Jordan Everly than right. the, uh, <laughs> the yeah the player so um, I but I, I I I it would make me so happy mm, yeah yeah no I I mean again I love the guy but I just don't know uh, if he's like a permanent solution there but uh, I just don't forget that you know there were times when he made you want to pull your hair out or at least me anyway okay uh so that sets up our big. Main event uh, on Sunday at MetLife Stadium right here in New Jersey uh, between the Islanders and Rangers. The day before is the Flyers-Devils game. Those guys get the Jonas Brothers as their intermission entertainment. The Islanders get some band AJR. I think they're, I have never heard of these guys. People tell me they're fine. I get it. It's fine. I still want Pat Benatar. I will always choose Pat Benatar over just about anybody. Uh, and we didn't get it. So I'm already kind of turned off by it. Um, People are excited about this. I, I, you know, they're excited about the jerseys. It's going to be made into a big spectacle, however, and I'm not trying to be the Debbie Downer, be the, you know, big bucket of cold water. However, I was thinking about it this week and, you know, preparation for this podcast. And it, it seemed to occur to me that like the stuff about like the sort of majesty and spectacle of hockey is kind of lost on. Like, I don't know if it's an Islanders thing or it's a me thing, or I don't know if it's being an old thing. I don't get it. But like, this Islanders season has gone the way it has gone, and I just want them to win a game. I don't care if it's indoors at UBS Arena, outdoors at MetLife Stadium, on the International Space Station, hovering above the Earth. I don't care. Like, I just want them to get two points and inch closer to, <laughs> to a playoff spot and separate themselves from some of these other teams that are around them. 
um, the idea of like, you know, somebody, Emily Kaplan or whoever interviewing Brock Nelson or Anders Lee before the game, be like, Oh, does this remind you of playing on the pond in Minnesota? I have no, I don't care that the blue angels flying overhead, the fireworks, the whole big thing. I absolutely do not care. And I'm sorry to say that I was at the first one 10 years ago with uh, my friends from lighthouse hockey and uh, we almost froze to death. So that was a fun experience and I never want to do it again. And I have no interest in going to this game at all. Uh, I just want the Islanders to win the game. And that that's unfortunate. You know, if they were in a different situation, if this was, you know, um, kind of a more Islander centric thing, if this was at Belmont park and the, you know, the, the rink was in the middle of the, uh, the racetrack, that would be pretty cool. Cause it, you know, it's my, it's our home. It's our thing. It's a long Island thing. This is the second time the Islanders have had an outdoor game. It's the second time they've been part of this sort of like two day outdoor, you know, all you can eat smorgasbord of hockey. And I just feel like they're getting these sort of pity, pity games. The same with the devils. Like you're telling me that neither the devils nor Islanders can like hold their own outdoor game. I don't understand, I guess, but we have to involve the Rangers and flyers here. Like why, why do the Rangers always have to be involved here? Why can't the Islanders play somebody else on, on long Island somewhere? I don't know. So for a lot of reasons, I, I don't really care. Also, MetLife Stadium is just in the middle of nowhere, and it's the worst. And I don't want to ever go there, despite the fact that th- my f- favorite football team plays there. Uh, I don't know. Again, I don't expect people to feel the same way. That's how I feel. I'm going to be watching it, but I have no no like kind of special feelings towards it either way. Uh, where are you feeling right now? Obviously, they need two points. Obviously, we want to be. This is the first time they're playing the Rangers this season, which is another stupid thing. Um, and besides all that, like, where do you come down on the the majesty and the spectacle of this particular stadium series game. Yeah. I think what you said in the, in during that was a point I agree with the most, which is that if the situation was different, I think I would be more into the whole um, spectacle, but the fact that the Islanders just desperately are going to need two points kind of, right. you know, yeah. makes it all I care about is, is what happens in between the whistles. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I understand it, it sounds like a lot of people are going to make a good day out of it which is great. Um, hopefully they go and, and, and give yeah. them hell and, and the Islanders sure. can get two points. But um, yeah, I think, uh, like I said, it, it, I will love it and I'll never forget it if the Islanders win and <laughs> I will hate it. And I will also never forget it if, if the Islanders <laughs> lose. So uh, this is, uh, right. That's yeah, it just, it all comes down to, to just needing them to win there and they yeah. need to, they need to keep getting points here and they've got two games this week. So hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, going to be a yeah. weird, um, a weird week coming ahead with uh with the way that the schedule sets up and just the stakes for for both Islander games. Yeah, because they, um, they 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 essentially need they need minimum three points out of these games and yeah um they're not uh either neither one of them are are easy opponents. There's one that's very very strange because of <laughs> the um uh, environment um mm-hmm. because it's being like you said it's being played at the Meadowlands and then there's have- another one that's very strange just because yeah. of uh, a, a non-conference opponent yet a massive 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 game it, it almost reminds me of one of those uh you know a, a, a game where in, in like ncaa basketball or something where two non-conference teams play and hmm. you're like well you know the winner of this one probably gets in and, and to the tournament or, or <laughs> makes a compelling case they're on the these these are two bubble teams playing and um that's that's how it feels to me in a weird way so um, the spectacle will have to take a back seat to uh to the actual game here, which is another thing that the NHL really doesn't understand um <laughs> about hockey fans, I think, and or maybe the networks don't that yeah, you know, we just we just want to see our team win. Basically, yeah. we don't really need to see uh uh anything else. We don't need the bells and whistles. Just give us a place to watch the game. Yeah. Um, but that you actually reminded me of two things right now. One is yeah, the, the environment is is everything with that game because we just don't know what could happen. You know, it's not like playing, you know, the Islanders are usually pretty good playing against the Rangers at MSG. This is not MSG. Like, this is a whole other thing. And it has nothing to do with the Rangers. It has something to do with everything, you know, the weather. We might get snow this week. So who knows what temperature is going to be like out there. So you really can't put any sort of, you know, stock or, or predict that game at all. Like you can, you could look at whatever model you want. It doesn't really matter because they're outside. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that, you know, you talk about games being memorable, and I was thinking again about how, like, the NHL deserves a lot of credit for the Stadium Series idea and the Winter Classic, which has been obviously a huge, huge success for them. It doesn't happen all that often for this sport, but, like, the, you cannot argue with the success 
of what these outdoor games have done for them, which is great. But the problem is there's been a lot of them. And the more I think about them, I can think of a few that are memorable, you know, even to this day, the, the Buffalo uh, P- Pittsburgh one where there was all snow and Crosby scored and getting the shootout. That was like the first one or, you know, one of the first ones that was a huge moment there. Obviously the Islanders at, at Yankee stadium against the Rangers was one. Uh, there was the, um, I think the, uh, the leaps and, and red wings and Michigan stadium was kind of one that I remember for some reason. And uh, there was the uh, ducks and Dodgers uh, ducks and Kings at Dodger stadium which was memorable because A, holy shit, they put an ice rink in the middle of Dodger Stadium in LA, and B, Kiss was there, which I thought was really interesting. Like, why is Kiss at the <laughs> NHL Outdoor Stadium Series game in LA? But uh, that's about it. Everything else kind of like blends together. I remember there was one a couple of years ago where it was like, I think it was Caps and Blackhawks at the, uh, the Nationals Stadium down in DC. And I just, I was watching it like, I have no, no interest in this. I don't care about this. Like the stadium means nothing to me. These teams mean nothing to me i've seen them play these outdoor games before and it just i don't even know who won like it was just like ugh, you know i guess whatever so i don't know they all kind of blend together after a while if people don't you know pay attention to this i wouldn't be surprised so i don't know that's a, kind of another problem I have with this whole thing but i mean again it's great great that they do it but they've done too many <laughs> they all blend together and you know no matter how many uh how many crazy jerseys you come up with it just doesn't seem all that interesting to me but if you're gonna if you're going enjoy it I really and sincerely hope you have a good time. I hope the weather is good. You're not freezing your asses off like we did at Yankee Stadium 10 years ago. Obviously, I hope the Islanders win. Hope I hope that you get out of the MetLife parking lot in less time than it takes them to play the game. That's basically what I want to say, too. <laughs> so that's that. Uh, oh, sorry. One other thing. Um, the only good thing about having two games this week is it opens up a lot of time for the Islanders to uh, pick up some games in hand. So I have a feeling we're going to be having that conversation at some point. And again, games in hand are only good if you win them. So there are, they already have a game in hand on, I think, on a couple of teams, the Flyers and, and I think Caps, because the Caps are playing today. But uh, they might end up with a couple more between uh, Tuesday and uh, well, Wednesday and uh, Sunday next week, so, or this week. So we'll have to see. Hopefully, again, they can, they can win those games. Okay, moving on to some fun stuff, as we've teased before. It's been an eventful week up in Toronto. Didn't expect to do a Master Leaf Theater this week. But our hand has been forced. Uh, So let's get to it. This week's latest edition of Master Leaf Theater. Okay, we'll get to Johnny Tax Evasion again in a little bit. (laughs) But let's talk about what happened on Saturday night in Ottawa. So the Leafs were playing their division rival, their uh, province, provincial rival, the Ottawa Senators, who are, what now, 20 points out of the playoffs? The Senators have just been at a miserable season, and uh, they put a hurt on the Leafs. And they were up 4-3 with about 12 seconds left in the game. Ridley Gregg basically breaks in on the Leafs' empty net because they had pulled Martin Jones, more on him in a second, and scores an empty net goal using a slap shot. He did not daintily slide the puck in. He did not gentlemanly present the puck to the net as one is supposed to do in a situation like that. He took a big slap shot right into the net. Leafs defenseman Morgan Riley didn't like this and uh, took out his frustration on Greg by coming up behind him and cross-checking him in the face, neck, somewhere high (laughs) on his body. And this has been fueling uh, all the drama here today on Sunday. Nobody seems to really care about the Super Bowl that's being played later today. Uh, But everybody cares about Morgan Riley and what's going to happen now. We have heard that the Department of Player Safety is going to give him an in-person hearing, which means it's going to be five games or more, or I guess six games or more. And uh, this has been absolutely hilarious. Everybody, as you said in our group chat, is perfectly playing their parts. It's amazing. I want to talk to you about first about the Greg thing. Um, was it a dick move? Yeah. Does he deserve a cross check in the, in the neck slash face? No. Um, if that was me and somebody did that to the Islanders, my first note would have thought would have been, well, if the Islanders had won the game, they wouldn't be in this situation. So that was pretty stupid. Uh, what do you make of the Greg play and the, uh, the hit by Morgan Riley? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I want to say that uh, Ridley Greg is a – He's he's an Islander in in more yes. ways than one. True. Um, he was the the Islanders when the Islanders traded for JG Pajot, uh, the draft pick that they traded. 
uh, for Pajot was used on Ridley Gregg. So this was, once again, another cosmic bit of cosmic evidence to throw on the heap. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was it was a, a type of thing that when I was watching it, I was like, oh, that was kind of funny. Of course, it was, you know, against the Leafs. And I'm going to be biased when I say it was funny. Like, I'm cracking up. I'm laughing. And then... <laughs> um, but no, it didn't like jump out to me right away. Like I was like, "Oh, this guy just slapped." I feel like I've seen that happen. And no maybe kidding. I'm crazy. No, and, I thought I have too. <laughs> yeah, like people are saying, like this is like the first. It feels like this is the first time it's ever happened. But of course, it's, it's just the first time it's happened uh, to Toronto. And um, yeah, he's. This is a. Uh, you know what? We'll. I guess we'll we'll just keep it to the to the actual on ice incident before we get into the reaction. And so yeah, I thought it was great. And then Riley goes over and cross checks him in the face, which don't understand how anybody can um defend him for that but i i I would just say there's like 800 other options that he could have went with Mm -hmm. um do you remember when nikita kucherov like slashed jg pajot on the back of the leg in the bubble yeah like i thought i when i saw riley come into the picture i'm like oh he's gonna do that um and then when i saw where what like then i saw where his hands were um i was like oh no he's he's gonna go poor man's dale hunter on us here he does and look, I've seen this this video. I've watched this video a million times, and I'm gonna watch it a million more. I'm probably just gonna ignore the Super Bowl and stay on Twitter and watch this discourse completely unravel. Um, because it it's great. But I I'll, I'll there's a couple things that you need to to watch the video for. And my favorite part is you watch you watch this happen. <laughs> Riley cross checks uh, Greg in the face. Greg goes down in the heap because he just got hit in the face with a stick. Um, the a couple players come in, uh, the guy they drafted, uh, before Victor Hedman's involved, Austin Matthews is pulling people over like William Nylander, some chain mm. Pinto is grabbing yeah. somebody, he's grabbing Riley, another Islander, uh, Pinto and, uh, nine Mississippi. I counted <laughs> from, from the cross check to this moment, Mitch Martyr kind of just comes fluttering in. Yeah. Does like a little, like. Yeah. Hop step, almost like he was about to start like doing the uh, the gritty or something, <laughs> as he's like skating in and just, just stands there. He he skates in and my fr- he's like, "Hey guys, what's going on?" Like that's yeah. literally <laughs> his way. Re- hey guys, what's going yeah. on here? It, like, it, 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 it's almost like he, he was gonna take his hand to his mouth and go, "Oh," <laughs> you know, like like a schoolyard, like the guy right. in the schoolyard who never gets involved right. in the in the. Right. Fr- but is always there to to, to flavor flavor it. It's like, oh, what's up? You know, my homeboys. And everyone's like, read the room, Mitch. Yeah. Um I was, and that's my maybe yeah. my favorite part of the entire thing is that right. he 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 does that and all I wanted to all I was waiting for this morning was uh people haven't really got into Zapruder filming that part of the f- footage yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still are we're still working on the is it a single shooter where we're we're looking for evidence in the Texas book depository. Mm. right now uh so we haven't gotten to the uh to the to the maple east reaction there was a little bit of it talking about like how muted it was uh but i'm gonna give nick kiprios a couple days here to catch up on oh yeah uh, on marner because i cannot wait for for what he's gonna have to deal with uh you know that Mm. steve simmons might write a column saying (laughs) that morgan riley is punished but mitch marner should be paying his suspension Mm. because of you know what he did or, or didn't do and how does Mitch Marner still play on this team after <laughs> you come into a scrum and don't fight anyone? Uh, so good. Like that's what that's what Kiprios is going to say. Yeah. yeah, so I'm I am forever and I have a couple of Senator jerseys. I bought a Patrick Laleem jersey on on eBay like years <laughs> in, in, during my during COVID, and I was just buying hockey jerseys to keep myself sane and i also bought a white senator's jersey from the 90s that i might get ridley griggs i might go to <laughs> stitches to right now wow. just go to get ridley griggs number on there uh because yeah. you know it wasn't just what he did that was mm. great it was that he what he that one slap shot just it opened up this insane can of worms right. insane can of worms um and the, the sense fans of course were chanting pay your taxes like this was <laughs> This was something special. This was a yeah. special, special, special hockey night in Canada. Yeah. Um, and as we can get into, and I'm very excited to talk about the uh, the reaction and the discourse has been yeah. every. It's sometimes it's hard to explain the this the the Maple Leafs and why we hate them and like get it down to like the the, the details because so much of it is unta- it's it's intangible. Like you can't feel it, you can't explain it. 
Hmm. This moment kind of just gives gives you the exact evidence you need to show people like, okay, so why do you hate the Maple Leafs? Hmm. Be like, well, this happened and here's how they're viewing it. And and here's how they view everything else. And, and you can say like, does this annoy you that, that this is how these people act? And they can say yes. Yeah. Yeah. The discourse has been just absolutely fantastic. And maybe because it's a Sunday and everybody kind of wants to get it all out before the game. But uh, it's it's been fantastic. Real shout, real quick, shout out to Sens fans. Thank you for mentioning the pay your taxes chant. That is absolutely outstanding. And my only regret, once again, that we couldn't do this first at UBS Arena because that chant, first of all, I mean, it's going to happen next time the Leafs play there anyway, but that chant was just perfect. And I, you couldn't have asked for a better spot for that to happen than in Ottawa. And like, it, there, there was a reporter that, had tweeted that and all the replies were all these like Leafs fans being like, Oh, these, these government employees are all, they want their money and all this stuff. No, it's not that they just hate your team. They hate your team and they hate its cap and they don't like that. He's getting away with maybe not paying his fair share. Again, we'll get there in a second. But uh, so the game starts with a pay your taxes chant and it ends with this huge can of worms being opened by this, this uh, forbidden slap shot that should never have had this cursed slap shot that happened. And the takes have been fantastic. You cannot, there's, there's no shortage of them out there. Uh, so this is just one. Uh, but I mean, if you just looked around, uh, you'll find a lot more, particularly on Twitter. Luke Fox jukebox is might be on uh vacation this week. Cause he hasn't, he hasn't written anything yeah. about this, but that's okay. Cause we have a new, a new voice in our master leaf theater uh repertory company here and it is rachel dory now rachel you i believe works for the hockey news right now writing about the nhl and betting you may remember her from her uh, disastrous uh, tenure with the canucks front office uh, a while back and uh she has three tweets here that i've isolated for our master leaf theater uh this is going to require a little acting from me hopefully i can bring this to life and, and capture it in the way that it really should be captured because it is spectacular. And again, this is just one person's thinking on this and it kind of encapsulates what a lot of Leafs fans are thinking. And regardless of what she might say, she's a Leafs fan, just like all the rest of them are big Jim Myrtle, Dom, whatever his name is, all these folks at the athletic, they're all kind of cut from the same cloth. So <clears throat> Rachel writes this and I'm just going to condense these three tweets. So she writes, I have no issue with what Morgan Riley did. You can't say the Leafs are soft and get mad when players do that. He could have lowered the stick, sure, but if you take a half clapper into an empty net, you gotta expect the response is coming, especially in a rivalry game. I literally said he could have lowered his stick. Can people read? This sports net panel is a good discussion. Riley should get suspended. Let's all remember that the Department of Player Safety puts code over everything, so I wouldn't be shocked if he got less than expected. He's also a leaf, which comes with an automatic tax, parentheses, which has been well documented, I'd guess four to six. Wow. That is a tour de force. Thank yeah. you, Rachel. This has been fantastic. I think at the, at the end of at the end of the season, we'll give out our uh, our Master Leap Theater superlatives <laughs> and hopefully relive some of these moments. That's a great uh, idea. That's because great idea. yeah, you 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 read John Bucci Gross's mushroom trip, uh, <laughs> Nikita and Kucherov induced yeah. uh, finding himself moment last right. weekend. I was like, I don't think we can get anything more ridiculous than that. Maybe right. maybe stuff that's like more unhinged, maybe, but mm. or more. Um, you know, whiny about the Leafs, but I don't think it's going to get more ridiculous than that. But this one is, it's crazy. This is some yeah. crazy talk here. Um, <laughs> let's, let's, the, my favorite part is how it, it, um, the tone of voice on this one is that I'm, I'm right. I'm, yeah. I'm right. Cause I'm always right. Yeah. And yet it's a contradiction right off the ja uh, right off the, uh, right off the jump. Uh, because, the tweet starts with how um, I've got no problem with, with, with what Morgan Riley did, mm. except I would have done it differently, <laughs> which, which right away means, Oh no, you, you, I, Oh, sorry. I have no issue with what Morgan Riley did. Yeah. Um, he could have lowered the stick though. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so you do have issue. Like it's, mm. uh, 
it's it's it right. was a violent, dangerous thing that if it happened to uh to one of your beautiful Maple Leafs, this is uh right. this is gonna be a, a situation. Mm. Um the f- flags would be lowered to half staff. And and oh my god. Yeah. This is the crazy thing I'm 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 watching unfold here is that there's thirty one fan bases that think that the um I shouldn't say thirty one. There's probably like twenty eight fan bases that are aware of this and, and think that there's some sort of um, Maple Leafs, pro Maple Leafs bias in the media, because it seems like there is, and, and pro media, pro Leafs bias in the way that the sport is covered. Uh, the rights holders are all, the, the Leafs make them the most money, so they're the ones that get focused on the most. There's this huge kind of agreement among most of the, the fan bases in the NHL. Mm. And then Maple Leafs fans somehow want to play, um, you know, Division Three school playing Alabama <laughs> in, in Tuscaloosa every week. It's like yeah. once again, here come the you know the the poor little Leafs, scrappy mm-hmm. as ever. None of them make any money. They're all they're all semi pros. One of right. them just watch. <laughs> you know, one of them's a boiler fixer. And look at them. They just they just won again. Like this team is something. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, like everybody's against them. There's this you know Illuminati conspiracy against the Leafs. Uh, mm-hmm. and the the outcry is over. A man cross-checking another man in the face. Right. Like, <laughs> what? Wait. Yeah. So you think that there's a consp- there's a conspiracy at play here and a lease tax because somebody got cross-checked in the face? Mm. Not. He didn't just trip him. They didn't. He didn't like try to fight him. And Greg, Ridley Greg turtled. Mm. He objectively right. cross-checked him in the face. If I walked out my front door right now with a hockey stick and cross-checked the first person that walked by me in the face, mm. I would be in jail for a long time. Like yeah. that's, that's what this guy did. And and of course, you know, you, this is happening in a hockey game. So it's a different environment. Mm. But the point is that one person here cross checked another person in the face. And there are people defending him that mm. normally when this stuff happens and there's, right. there's, there's proof of this in from, from uh, Miss Dory in that people have brought to light. Like, where she's calling for the book to be thrown at folks for for doing things um, that aren't cross checking somebody in the face. So mm. this is, uh, yeah. yeah, this is this is a lot to get into. This is something that's not gonna. I'm not gonna even be able to get through like the first three chapters of this because of uh, it's it's pretty deep here. Yeah. Um, and and of course she's not the only one who's who's having this this reaction, including oh, yeah. the, the head coach, the head coach that is an appropriate. Yes. Appropriate thing to do. So not only did Sheldon Keefe say, I thought the response was appropriate for what, you know, that, that empty net goal, but Martin Jones, the goalie who was pulled so that Riley Ridley Gregg could uh, score this, you know, uh, I guess disrespectful empty net goal was like, that was a pretty stupid move on their guy's part. Brother, your teammate just cross-checked that dude <laughs> in the face. So if we're going to talk about pretty stupid moves, I think we should start with that one. <laughs> When I read that, I was like, what? That was a pretty stupid move on their guy's part? What about your guy's part, dude? Come on. Anyway, <laughs> there's, again, this is just, it's so funny. It's, yeah, it's, it's so insane. It, 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 <laughs> there's uh, this, this kind of community of, uh, of Leafs fans who, who are, have yeah. you know, platforms that right. have the, the smallest amount of self-awareness I've seen maybe of, of any human being <laughs> because they're, they're, they're talking about their player as if he is right there there's here's the here are the facts of the argument right mm. one player slap shotted a puck into a, a net which is an inanimate object mm. and then another player then took a hockey stick and whacked him in the face with it and we're being told to believe by this community of people mm. that one of these things is a lot worse than the other yeah and once again, if, if I were to, to present this case to normal people who don't know what happened, mm-hmm. I'd say this guy did this player, a Ridley Gregg did this player B mm-hmm. Morgan Riley did this. Who's crazy here. And then yeah. I would say, wait, actually, before you answer that, I want to, I want to also say there's a group of people that think that player B Morgan Riley is the, in, in the right. So who's crazy here. And they'd all say, mm-hmm. you know what? Neither of the players, the people who think that Morgan Riley did the right thing, those are the crazy people. Throw those people in jail. I don't really yeah. care. Like <laughs> this guy just lost his temper. Those people are just ap- 
unfit. Yeah. <laughs> like, like what? It's um. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 so good. Uh, this is the stuff that we live for. Yeah. I I, I the senators and the senators fan base deserve so much credit for the yeah. way that they they've handled this situation. The 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 pictures of Ridley Grigg. Go, Greg, however you say his name, going up are are just fantastic. The senators named him the player of the game. <laughs> the tweet was yeah. like he, he, he took one slap shot into an empty net. He's our player of the game. Yeah. Like this is right. It's man, great. it's yeah. And it just it this is it goes to the point, which is that these people just can't wrap their mind around that everybody yeah. hates you and they have yeah. reason to. This right. stuff does might they're like oh. The, the Jets, the Jets, their their Super Bowl is beating the Leafs. The every team Super Bowl is beating the Leafs. Yeah, because you are so hated. You're so easy to hate. You make it so yeah. easy to hate you guys. Right. Because and it's not just you or the players. Like, yeah, you have very cringy players and you've got a an annoying coach and you had this GM for a while that people right. thought of in the same way that people thought of the Pope in like the 1700s. <laughs> it's it, that stuff's all part of it. Right. But you also have guys who are writing like that people in the front office were mourning when that GM was fired mm. or that that GM climbed mountains more than right. that, that we can dream of. Yeah. Um, uh, or that, you know, Alex Galchenyuk is, is going to be fixed, fixed now. Yeah. yeah. He's fixed now. Like all this, yeah. there's, there's so much that we hate about you guys. Mm. That's why this stuff happens yeah. to you. It's not, it's, it's your own fault. This is a, this is a, a bed of your own making. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, it's been fun. I can't wait for it to continue. Um, we, I set the over under at 11 and a half minutes on, on this incident on 32 thoughts on Monday morning. And I think that even might be a little short. I think we yeah. could, we could be looking at like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, but man, if, if, if I was, um, if I was a man of, of any serious, like unfathomable wealth, I would be donating so much. I would have Wrigley Greg on the phone and be like, what charity? Yeah. You just name it, buddy. You name that charity. I will. I will set it up and I, maybe I'll just set up a charity event where like we just set up a, an empty net and just have people just slap shot it in and we'll just <laughs> donate money for everyone that goes in the goal. And Sled, it's, yeah. I, I couldn't love this guy more. It's so funny. Um, you know what? It, we've been at this a long time. I just want to let, let's just do screw it. We'll just blow it out. we got, I got another one here uh, <laughs> from a guy. If you listen to sports net radio and listen to the Jeff Merrick show, you may know Matt Marchese. He is the, his producer, I guess. And he had a couple of tweets here, too, that are also too funny. And I, you talk about the lack of self-awareness, the lack of understanding of what it is that people think the Leafs are, why they hate the Leafs. This is that in a series of two tweets that have, you know, lines in between. So, again, this is calls for a very dramatic reading. So uh, this was the tweets here. <clears throat> he says, if you don't understand why Morgan Riley did what he did, then it can't be explained to you. Funny that so many former players get it and know the response was necessary. Even funnier that people who never played are the ones calling for the death penalty. If this happened with any other team, it wouldn't be getting nearly the same attention. Hilarious stuff. Well, he's right about one thing. If this happened to any other team, it wouldn't be getting nearly the same attention because we hate you. We hate you. And you, <laughs> because you guys make everything a big deal. That's the thing. And, and, and if you can't, that's the thing. Like if you can't recognize that, like, like right. <laughs> if you can't recognize that you just happen to be the team that this happened against. And that's why this is everyone's right. pointing and laughing. Cause sometimes you get got like, that is the problem here. Um, but like if this was a 10 30 PM puck drop and it happened in a game between the ducks uh, and the Kraken, um, all right. would be mentioned was um okay elliot uh and there was also that ugly incident in uh the shark yeah. tank on saturday night looks like a, a seven game suspension for mike hoffman anything you have to say about that um no seems right jeff mm, yeah uh, uh by the way like uh just wanted to mention that uh matt barzell um mm. He was playing in the skills competition the other day and <laughs> like but, but it, it just would be a footnote but it's not and and, well, they would talk I, about, well, how about the rivalry budding between the Coyotes yes. and Ducks? Like, that's yes, like, okay, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, man. A terrible thing, if we yeah. can give me seven games of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there's just one problem there. Uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is, um, it, it. these people just don't understand what makes this so funny. 
and the the once they do realize it yeah. it's it'll stop becoming less funny it'll and it'll stop be, we'll we'll stop this like on a dime because it just the mm. bit ends right like the bit ends when the uh kind of the people being poked fun at come to their senses here and they're just they're showing no sign of it at all because it it <laughs> It was an absolutely hilariously unique hockey thing that happened, and it's part of what makes the sport so fun to to like be a part of at times. And and this is the kind of stuff that we should be, um, you know, it's so entertaining and insane. It makes no sense, mm. and then it just gets that part of it gets stomped all over by these people mm. who just can't get around the fact that people are mad at the Maple Leafs or don't like the Maple Leafs when they we're the underdog story here. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, you and you and that bloated payroll are. <laughs> so I, yeah, I'm excited because this is not over. Um, no, not at all. I don't know uh, when they play again next, but I'm sure that Jeff Merrick will remind us. Oh yeah. And yeah, he's know that it was circled. And I really, really, really hope that um, Riley gets like some, some absurd, <laughs> sent uh sus- suspension like not even yeah. like outlandishly absurd well, uh like oh no they don't because they don't play again this season uh but i really hope that that that's yeah. what happens here like he just gets like 22 games or something crazy well, that was part of the thing too was like greg was celebrating because like the senators had uh won the season series like i guess they went two and one or whatever against the Leafs. so it was a big moment for them so yeah uh but i mean it'll it'll happen next year it doesn't yeah. really matter the Leafs so. tax yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's so good yeah, the right, leafs yeah. tax okay it's fantastic uh so speaking of taxes real quick uh about <laughs> john Tavares. so if you missed all this uh he is apparently in a skirmish with the canadian revenue agency which is their version of the irs over the taxes on his uh signing bonus so when he signed with the leafs back in 2018 he was under the impression that he would be charged 15 percent on those, that amount, uh, and the Canadian revenue association agency is sort of like, nah, it's more like 38%, uh, which is obviously a big difference. So he claims that there's some sort of provision in the law that is specific for Canadian, you know, professional athletes who I guess, you know, maybe may or may not have worked in the United States or whatever, uh, that claims it's 15%. So now they're going back and forth. Um, it's not like, you know, he's going to go to prison or anything. I'm sure at some point they'll figure it out and, He'll either pay, either they'll say, yeah, you're right, or he'll have to end up paying it. Uh, but I really hope this guy gets, you know, pay your taxes chance for the rest of his career. And I guarantee, again, if this had happened at UBS Arena, I think we would have seen some tears. I think because it would have been everybody doing it. There would have been almost no, I mean, you know, a Senator's Leafs game is probably half Leafs fans anyway. So you're muting it a little bit like that. But uh, he, we might have seen some real tears on the bench. I think it would have been a lot of fun uh, to have happened there and uh, just great. And so, uh, you know, just it's tax season. Nobody likes paying their taxes. I don't even understand how mine work. And every year I go to H and R block and this very nice lady named Dolores helps me out. And every year she's, she explains this stuff to me. And every year I'm like, I can explain to you the dumbest, stupidest, most insane thing from the stupidest comic book, sci-fi movie or whatever. And I literally have absolutely no idea what you're talking about right now. Uh, but it's funny to us that John Tavares is in the skirmish with the Canadian IRS. So uh, please enjoy it. And I hope it goes on forever. I hope this happens. I hope it goes on after he's retired. I hope they still come for his money. I hope there's like, you know, men in black, like chasing him around the, the streets, trying to, you know, like the kid from Better Off yeah. Dead, another John Cusack movie. Where's my $2? You know, the whole thing. So <laughs> uh, hopefully there it is. But uh, yeah, what is, uh, any final thoughts on Johnny Tax Invasion? Yeah, just, sure. I'm perfect. I'm so happy that this is going on. And and Matt, I was with uh, Usher Matty uh, at the game on Thursday night. He He sat with my dad and I for a good chunk of it. And he brought up a great point that, uh, Toronto or Canada, I guess in general, might be the only place on the planet where the person here is saying, "No, no, no, charge me the Long Island rate." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. So wow. this is, uh, yeah, it's great, and like once again, like the the fact that we're sitting here like kicking ourselves, like, damn, wish, wish this could have come out like right before that they played the Islanders at home, mm. just goes to show you that how much people hate this team. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not it's not unique to us. Of course, our situation is unique. We have like this. It's not like a big brother syndrome with them. It's right. there's there's actual uh, stuff that happened here uh, mm. that has made us really hate them. 
and we're not alone. Like, yeah. who, who, I would say no matter what, if he had played in Montreal, the next, their, his next road game was in Montreal, mm. Boston, um, Winnipeg, Vancouver, go down the list. Like you can name 15 teams mm. where, um, he was going to run into this chant and, and the fact that it all happened in this one game with that ends up in a circus is, is just so great. Um, I'm, I'm really happy. Like you said, I'm jealous. Cause like you, it would have been, it would have just been, I, I think I would have brought like an old W two <laughs> if, if, if he was playing the Islanders instead of the right. senators on Saturday night, I would have just thrown W twos on the ice or uh, uncle Sam hats. Yeah. Chant chanting like render unto Caesar, what is Caesar's <laughs> stuff? You know, it would have it would have been a lot of fun. Um, but we'll get him when he's playing for uh the the Salt Lake City Coyotes next next year or whatever, <laughs> wherever wherever he gets bought out to. Yeah. Um because yeah, it was a it's you know, I'm happy that that we we're talking about this stuff so much because it it was such a generally positive week for the Islanders. They did win two out of three, they're still mm-hmm. alive, they got some some sort of help on the school. Like they weren't punished too bad by the out of time yeah, school board. Yeah. Uh, and then this stuff is all happening too. Patrick was still the coach. Like mm. it does seem like the tables are turning a little bit here, maybe slowly, like mm. turning like boats instead of tables. But um, it does, it does feel like there's some, some positive momentum building cosmically mm. uh, for, for the Islanders. And, and I'm, mm. I'm really enjoying it um, because like this, this is this fan base. Uh, it's native language is spite and we're getting a lot of that right now. Yeah, no, that's true. Well, you know what? It is the lunar new year. Happy lunar new year to everybody. So maybe this is the Islanders new year happening right now. Uh, my goal for next week is to not talk about the Leafs. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we you bring this on. To the we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> because we'll this is, uh, yeah, this, yeah. You, m- you might have to make that goal, your goal for like two weeks from now, yeah. because this is, <laughs> I really feel like there's, Possibly. there's more coming here. Um, yeah. And there's going to be much, you know, like next, this whole week of the, we haven't heard anybody yet, right? Like we yeah. haven't heard Nick Kiprios and we haven't heard oh, 32 true, Thoughts. Yeah. So true, yeah. we haven't, Luke, Luke, Luke Fox Jukebox is still, you know, meditating over it, trying to <laughs> search for enlightenment on on what to say and, and what right. um, what allegories to use for, hmm. for the cross check. And Chris Johnston is, you know, I don't know if he's calling the cops or he's outside George Paros's office right now. He's organizing with, a uh, charity marathon. Right. Um, to to right, yes. pay for Riley's suspension. <laughs> a mile for every, for every thousand dollars <laughs> right. to go to his suspension. Um, yeah. There's, there's so much. It's still here. So yeah, I, I would yeah. say that next week it'll be a little hard to, to ignore, uh, ignore the Leafs, but uh, maybe, maybe in two weeks we can, we Fair can enough. put this behind us. We'll see. Uh, but we will see. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, not an eventful week for the Islanders, but it will certainly be for the rest of the league (laughs) as we react to uh, whatever happens up in Toronto. Okay. We've had, we've had a long episode here. People, I'm going to put this out a little early so people can listen to it maybe before the Super Bowl. So a couple of real quick announcements. Uh, Friday is our next episode of weird Islanders, the podcast. It's one we recorded back in September. So it's been a while, but it's a, it's a really, really good one about a player that we get asked about a lot and is actually kind of a, uh, Part one of a little bit of a two part uh, kind of thing. They're not exactly related to each other, but they kind of are. It'll make a lot more sense once you hear part one. And that comes out on Friday. So check it out. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, with one of our favorite guests. So uh, take a look, take a listen for that uh, on Friday. Uh, We'll be back next week uh, at some point. Uh, We haven't decided when we're going to record, but uh, we'll see uh, how it works out after the uh the outdoor game reminder that our live event is march 30th at the beautiful brand new offside tavern in new york city things are going to kick off around four and if you're coming and you have some weird islanders swag we want to see it we want to talk to you about it because we're going to be using it for uh, a live episode of the show coming out later this season so march 30th on a saturday Islanders are playing tampa bay on the road that day uh offside tavern four o'clock so be there uh i guess that's about it uh yeah that's <laughs> that's about it uh sign up at patreon.com slash islanders anxiety for ad free episodes bonus content and more follow us on twitter at isles anxiety pod leave us a review on apple Podcasts and on spotify our theme music is morning haze by family dinner listen to more of their music on Bandcamp and on spotify and hey we have we have a lot of fans uh in the uk listeners in the uk they're gonna be on tour there so check them out family dinner uh read lighthouse hockey every single day the most up-to-date islanders news and discussion 
Dom said it himself. The Islanders are a new team under Patrick Waugh. Uh, that was on Thursday, and then they look like the old Islanders on Saturday. <laughs> so uh, uh, no, we always have a finger on the pulse there, uh, as as always. So always read Lighthouse Hockey. And don't forget that Islanders Anxiety Podcasts are part of the Fans First Sports Network. Learn more at fansfirstsports.com. Shop at vintageicehockey.com. Try wines from the Pinot Project. Michael Leboff, where can everybody find you on Twitter? Uh, the Big Lebowski with two E's. Follow Mike at the Big Lebowski. Read and listen to his work at Action Network. Uh, I was reading Larry Brooks's column today on the New York Post, and a video pops up, and I'm like, hey, I know that guy. And it was Mike giving betting advice. So you can find him everywhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> listen to him. Uh, any final thoughts on all of the shit that we just talked about <laughs> for the last yeah. hour and 40 minutes? Yeah, it's, it's a lot. You know, I, we, one point I was making uh, a couple weeks ago is that like the NHL season is so long and, and you, it's impossible to predict and people think they can. And then Patrick Watt ends up as your head coach. But <laughs> it even goes to show you just can't even pre- predict a, a week out because um, the Islanders have a new hero. Like right. the Islanders fans and, and hockey fans now have a new hero uh, and, and it's Ridley Grigg. And that is not what I expected to be saying, um, mm. you know, a week ago. I thought that we'd just be talking about the Islanders and, and the playoff race. And instead, um, yeah, I'm um, just forever. I want this guy's number retired. His, his Senator's Jersey raised up to the UBS arena rafters. Mm. Um, so who knows, who knows who, who our heroes and villains will be. Yeah. Uh, seven days from now. We shall see. Uh, and it'll be outdoors. We're taking it outside as the NHL loves to repeat over and over and over again. Uh, so enjoy it. Again, have a good time. Hopefully it's not too cold. We will be back after that game to talk about what happened there, what happened in the Seattle game, and what's coming up for the Islanders the, season, the week after because it's kind of a packed one. Again, the Penguins are looming around the corner. So we will talk to you then. And uh, until then, take care. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.